Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tomorrow Space Orbit 12.36. I'm Jared. I'm going to be your host for today's episode where we will be talking about something that is so important to spaceflight that we wouldn't be able to do it without it. And to talk about it, we have Richard Stevenson, the, the operations director down at Canberra Deep Space <laughs> Network. So, yeah. So, Richard, can you tell us a little bit about what exactly is the Deep Space Network? Now, the Deep Space Network is essentially an interface uh, between uh, the project and the spacecraft. So obviously, if you're launching uh, a project, so if you want to be able to communicate with your spacecraft. And uh, so if, yes, the Deep Space Network or NASA's Deep Space Network uh, allows uh, that communication channel, uh, I suppose. So now there's three complexes around the world and uh, that's to provide 24 seven coverage. We're around about 120 degrees apart. Uh, we've got uh, Canberra, where I am at the moment. Uh, we've got Goldstone in California, uh, in between LA and uh, so Vegas, just off uh, a small town called Barstow. And then we've got one uh, just outside of Madrid in Spain as well. So it sounds like the DSN has a lot to work with. Are you guys like fully stacked 24-7, 365? Um, like things are scheduled down to the minute to make that happen? I, I definitely. So it's certainly all scheduled. Uh, JPL, actually, I should point out the, the hub of the DSM is JPL. Uh, so you, if anybody's been to JPL and seen the dark room, uh, so that which they refer to as the center of the universe. <laughs> uh, so the operations chief uh, sits there uh, with the TSSs and he's coordinating uh, the network. And then you have us at the stations as well, who are actually doing the tracking. Uh, so, so yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, sort of web all over the world. So I said with the three complexes, uh, the JPL hub, uh, so sort of is is the most important. And we were talking about interfaces with the project. Generally, the project interfaces with JPL. So, and we it talks to the complexes from there. So a project can subscribe. Uh, to their data, and they can have it delivered in real time from their spacecraft, or they can come in the following morning and find this nice little packaged up bit of data uh, that we received during the night. And Deepod Dolphin in our chat room is asking, are you going to be adding more ground stations in the future? As uh, Deepod Dolphin is noticing that there's a big gap over Asia. No, uh, no. It's funny because if you start looking at where the DSN is evolving, uh, they're now talking about optical as well. Uh, I think the first spacecraft that we have that's capable of optical is Psyche, uh, which is coming up in a few years' time. Uh, it's not in its core communication package. It's still classed as science. So, but yet, look, we might. And then we've got to start asking the question, is Canberra, Madrid, and Goldstone really suitable for optical? So there may be a separation at some point, uh, but at the, at the moment where the complexes are, you've got the infrastructure, uh, you've got the antenna. Uh, there doesn't have to be uh, any anymore because we, we have the 24 seven. What we do need to do, because we have fairly congested periods as well where the projects are fighting for time, we do need further assets. So currently in Madrid, you've got two, two new beam wave guides being built. Uh, so we're slated for another one in Canberra, and so is Goldstone. So yeah, what we're doing is we're we're increasing the number of assets at, at these complexes instead of building new complexes. So three sites—they're all very close to being equidistant from each other. Is that uh, is that a choice? Yeah, about 120 degrees. So they, they like to use a magic 120 because it, it divvies up 360 into three. Mm -hmm. uh, ESA uses the same one. Uh, ESA slips there slightly. So if you look at where the ESA stations are, they've got one in Western Australia, in New Norcia. Uh, they've got uh, one in Argentina, and they've, they've got one in Europe as well. So so they're doing the same thing. Uh, ESA only has a a 35 meter in each one. So, so occasionally we'll support uh, ESA spacecraft as well if, uh, if they're getting a little overloaded with their antenna as well. Yeah, I was actually going to ask, you know, because uh, uh, it's not necessarily a NASA spacecraft that DSN may be talking oh, about. No. Uh, who are some of the, no, no, no. who are some that you support? Well, at the, at the moment, so we support any agency that NASA has an agreement with. Uh, 
uh, and the, the current agencies with, uh, are JAXA, uh, and we support their Planet C and their Hayabusa 2 operations. Uh, we support Israel. Until recently, we supported the uh, Mandrayan, which was their uh, Mars orbiter, uh, and uh, Chandrayaan 2, which is their lunar orbiter. Uh, and so we, we supported the, the landing as, or the lander, uh, unfortunately, when it was unsuccessful too. But yeah, so we, the spill, the Israeli spill, uh, a couple of years back, so we supported that. And going forward, you know, I think we've got the Emirates on the books as well in a couple of years for their first spacecraft to the uh, to Mars. So yes, it's uh, any agency that uh, NASA has uh, an agreement with. And you have to obviously be operating the deep space network at all times. Uh, the Ghostkins in our YouTube channel is asking, um, you know, have the brush fires uh, that have unfortunately uh, been uh, affecting Australia, have they affected operations? And kind of to talk to that too, you know, here in uh, Southern California, we had a, a significant earthquake in July. We had a 7.1 that was out n uh, just about a couple tens of miles north of where Goldstone was at. Um, so do you, mm -hmm. does the Deep Space Network basically brush that off and just keep going? Not earthquakes. Very hard to brush with earthquake <laughs> off. Uh, so bit. as far as so, as far as the fires are concerned, so look, Canberra was impacted so in, in the early two thousands, and the fires came very close to the complex, and uh, they were fighting fires on the complexes uh, on the complex then. Uh, but one of the reasons why Canberra was was picked is as far as we have no fault lines, we're 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 one hundred percent stable here. Uh, Goldstone. And if you've been to Goldstone, they've just had an upgrade as well with all their racks and they have their new soft boots on the bottom as well, just to, to prevent damage in an earthquake. Uh, it was one of the first times I've known an, an antenna be stopped during an earthquake. So in the recent ones that you, you were just describing, so VSS 14, which is a big 70 meter there, nice picture. Uh, so, so yeah, so it was red and uh, required engineering uh, check out for that after the, the last one. But uh, there was no damage to that. Look, I suppose if you look at the, the antennas you're showing, that they're kind of robust antennas. So if you look at a radio astronomy antenna, and for a start, A, you might not have to move like little like Arecibo, it's just uh, the focus that changes. Uh, we have uh, our 34 meter of parks uh, run by CSIRO as well. But its uh, elevation only goes down to 30 degrees. Again, it's, it's meant to look at uh, celestial objects, not spacecraft. Uh, you look at uh, you know, the DSN antenna, they, they look like battleships. I mean, so the big, robust, uh, heavy, and it takes an awful lot to, uh, to have an impact on them. And in our YouTube chat, Gregorius Sudharmo, hopefully I got that right, Gregorius, uh, is asking, how big a bandwidth and fast can you push the Deep Space Network to? And are there upgrades planned in relation to the new Artemis and Mars projects? And also, uh, Raj Luthra in our YouTube channel um, is asking as well about upgrades to communicate with spacecrafts and rovers at faster communication speeds as well. So, like, what can you what can you really crank at? Like, what's the what's the fastest <laughs> up and down that you can do? And then what do you? And then well, you know, you're talking optical too. So, what are we looking at with that? Look, I have no idea with optical, so we haven't actually seen the, the design specs for the optical yet. But you look at, uh, it depends on the bands as well. And if you go through the DSM bands that we use, uh, Sierra band, which is two, about 2.2 gig. So we use that generally to the moon, a little bit beyond. So there are some agencies that use it beyond. Uh, then we start talking about X-ray band as well. So you start starting to talk of uh, deep space around about the 8 gig. 8.4. Uh, then you start kicking it up uh, to uh, Ka2, which is 26, 27 gig. And we, we use that for close Earth spacecraft that need to dump high rates of data. So you're looking at the likes of TESS, so who, who are delivering 400 megabits, so, which is kind of cranked in and out. Uh, so then you've also got the uh, K-band as well, which is a DSN K-band, which is for deep space like SPP or, or Parker. Solar probe, as it's called now, uh, and so so yeah, it's where do we go from here? People are saying that op optical. We really need optical if we're going to bring back the bandwidths we want to from Mars. 
but at the moment we seem to be able to, uh, to deliver the required bandwidth uh, with the existing spacecraft that we have. As I said, test with 400 megabits is incredible. Yeah, and I actually would like to go back to that screen that we had uh, while Richard was talking, showing uh, the dishes in real time. This is a thing called DSN Now. And Richard, can you speak to this a little bit for our viewers so they can know what they're looking at? Yeah, so well, uh, at the moment, this is a snapshot of what the network's doing. Uh, you've got the Madrid, Colstone, and Canberra antenna. Uh, look, I love this as well. So this isn't just for the public. So I'll quite happily have a look and uh, if, if I'm at home to see, which is a bit sad, uh, to see what we're supporting. Uh, so, and it shows a 70 meter and the three beam wave, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the three beam wave guides in each. And obviously the, the waveform coming down is what's being received. The waveform going up is what's being transmitted. Uh, you can see whether it's modulated or not. So there is a modulated wave on it. So you can see if it's just carrier or whether we actually are receiving telemetry, and in this case, uh, they all are. Uh, it shows the 70 meter as well in Canberra. It's actually doing three spacecraft. And uh, we're actually, you're talking about software developments and, and, and evolution of the DSN. Uh, it's been identified long ago that Mars was going to be the contention uh, where, you know, we're just going to have so many spacecraft around Mars and uh, so essentially not, a, not enough assets to support it. So a lot of the software developments and the systems at the moment is to expand that capability with Mars spacecraft to add more. Uh, the beauty of Mars is that we can point directly into the middle of Mars and the beam width of all the antennas incorporates not only the planet, but sort of a swathe of space on either side. So we don't have any spacecraft outside of that beam, even the big elliptical orbiters like MAVEN. Uh, so, and yeah, we've, uh, I've lost my chain of thought there, <laughs> so, so, but yeah, but so uh, we've, so with uh, the 70, 70 meter, and I'm actually just looking out the window at the 70 meter now, I, I might be able to just bring that up. Yeah, I was going to actually set up a camera. Go for it. You brought a prop today. There's hey, your prop. <laughs> I, I, I talk, talk to props. So this is a, a current view of the 70 meter. Uh, so we're tracking the three spacecraft, and as I said, so we... Uh, we point directly at Mars, and there's a number of spacecraft that we can track around it. There is one limitation, uh, and that is we can only uplink to one at a time. So we're talking about high bit rates and uh, so what's required by the project. So the big one around Mars at the moment is, is MRL. That requires lots of bandwidth. Uh, and they'll increase, I should, should also say that the spacecrafts have variable bit rates, so, so they can change it. So the, a spacecraft is, uh, is uploaded with a schedule, so it knows what antenna it's communicating with. So it knows that if a 34 meter is supporting, then it can drop that bit rate. But it knows that when it's over a 70 meter, then it can increase that bit rate uh, proportionally. So there is there's a little bit of leeway there. So for instance, MRO on the 70 meter here, so if, uh, it could be bringing down a high rate. We might not have an uplink available for it, but we can provide that uplink from a 34 meter. So it doesn't all have to be on the same antenna. We can bring telemetry down from one and provide a command capability through another. And that is an incredible amount of efficiency being built into a system. That's, that is just fantastic. Well, it is actually. So you're talking about efficiency and, and uh, you know, you're, you're looking at our days and we plan our days and how many spacecraft. Uh, you know, we, we, we fluctuate a little bit, but generally it's the high 20s. So, so for my day shift, and this isn't in a 24 hour period, so for my day shift, when Canberra took control of the network at uh, nine o'clock this morning, and so uh, we relinquished to, to Madrid at, at five and finish up at six. You know, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, we'll have 30 mid 20s, 30 supports during, during that period. Uh, and uh, Madrid and Goldstone will have something similar. So we currently have the mid 30s spacecraft on the books. So it's always a very busy schedule. And, and you can see when you look at the schedule, how difficult it is for projects to find time. Uh, obviously there is, if a project is desperate and uh, they declare a spacecraft emergency, it's the same as maritime law. 
uh, where all the other projects have to help out and, and uh, sort of give up some time. Uh, but yeah, other than that, so you know, the schedule, if you're planning, for instance, uh, an event or a launch in two or three years' time, that has to go into the schedule to see whether uh, the DSM is capable of supporting. Uh, but also, so you know, with uh, the other routine spacecraft, you know, you've got the Voyagers uh, that are supported almost on a daily basis, so they have to find time as well. So, so yeah, we when I talk about building new assets, that that's really to to not only allow more spacecraft, but also allow the existing spacecraft to be supported too. And uh, you talked about you know coming in and how many you do a day. What is your day to day like? Because I mean, this is the Deep Space Network is not diverse. Yeah, I would imagine <laughs> uh, it's like we said at the beginning of the show. It's not exactly something that a lot of people know about. Um, you know, I'm sure people can get a really easy day by day as to what it's like for somebody going into Johnson Space Center to be a flight uh, flight controller for the space station. But what the heck is it like being day by day doing operations at the Deep Space Network? Well, the, the, I said diverse. Uh, the, the beauty of the job, and you know, I started. I was recruited from the UK just straight out of college uh, in 1988. And uh, so the more I said, who wants to work for NASA in Australia? So, and I came over here for the uh, Voyager Neptune encounter just prior. Uh, so essentially there was a lead in for training. And since then, so I've been involved with every NASA spacecraft in the last 32 years. So uh, the Voyagers are, are the only ones now that uh, are st still going from, from when I started. Uh, but, but yeah, so the, the day when you, you walk in, it's, it's funny that after 32 years, you're still supporting the same spacecraft. You know, you see Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 like an old friend. Uh, but you also get the, the, the new projects coming in all the time. Uh, as far as my day, I'll walk in. And so I have a team of controllers. And I'm also a controller, so, so I can jump into the seats. In fact, that's what I love about the job, that I can sort of get my hands dirty. Uh, and it could be so, you know, one minute you're doing, you know, you avoid you, then you could be going on to a test, then you'd be going into a parker. You know, you could be having a, a few issues with Maven around Mars or, and, and that's what keeps it really interesting. It's just continuously cycling through. Uh, and just when things start to get a little mundane, so, a new project comes along. And so you'll go, oh my gosh, surely they're not going to try this. Now I can still remember where the Pathfinders uh, went uh, and landed on Mars uh, with the airbags, and we were all going, oh, what do you reckon the chance of that working is? Uh, but yeah, brilliantly successful. And so, uh, and we've been, after a bad run of Mars, uh, so sort of in the uh, you know, late 90s, so we've, it's, we've, it's been brilliant. So, sort of as far as uh, the success rate with our Mars missions since then. And what's it take to become a controller at the Deep Space Network? Well, it's funny because, as you said, you just can't go out there and say, ah, um, I think I'll recruit another controller. <laughs> uh, the, the background of all the controllers, are very, it used to be, it was very much RF. Uh, so my background is, is, is RF and radio on radar. And that's what I did at college. But we also have uh, the digit side as well and software. And as the DSN has evolved, so, so it has a role as well. Uh, obviously, the system administrator role is far more important. But we identified the fact that, you know, we'd recruited RF people and we'd recruited digit people and each offered unique skills. But we needed to get the RF people up on the digits and the digits up on the RF. So around about 10 years ago, uh, we actually had a certification program, uh, which was the first time that uh, essentially we had a... Uh, a NASA DSN controller certification program. So, so yeah, we, we've tried to do that benchmark. So regardless of where your background is, uh, there's, a, there's a common knowledge in, in the RF uh, and the digit side. And working for the Deep Space Network for over three decades, uh, I bet there has to have been some- Oh, it sounds so long when you say it that way. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I bet there has to have been a ton of interesting things that, have, that you have been witness to. Uh, throughout your time there. And Loopy in our chat room is actually asking, you know, do you have any interesting stories you could share? Any crazy hijinks, close calls, silly technical problems? Like what's, what's, the, wild, what's the wildest and funniest stuff that's happened to you? Look, so uh, but there, is so many, <laughs> there is so many. Uh, I have some people on the team uh, and they all say, oh, do you remember when we did this and, and we saw this with that spacecraft? I'm going, 
no, not really. So some people have far better memory than me. I just say, oh, that was an interesting day. I'll move on to the next. But, you know, you talk about spacecraft and so, sort of, uh, look, I, I love the story of uh, uh, in the early days, I think it was the uh, late 90s, uh, ESA had a cluster, their first cluster uh, spacecraft that were going to be launched. And uh, it was the first time ESA uh, had come over here to support one of those spacecraft. And they brought their own ground systems with them as well. And I can still remember, so you look at the DSN, it's all battleship gray. You walk into the front end areas and all the racks are battleship gray. It seems that it only came in one tone of paint. Uh, and their ground systems arrived and they were cream with Mercedes Benz all over the top. And I thought, oh wow, I never thought I'd ever have rack envy. <laughs> uh, and so, so the first cluster, we also had a, an ESA engineer out here, a gentleman called Peter. Uh, so, and he was going to be there for the, the launch and uh, an early orbit phase as well. And I can still remember standing in the operations room, so watching this launch. Uh, and obviously, if, if anybody knows the first cluster, it was unsuccessful and uh, ended up falling into uh, the swamps of French Guiana. But when we saw it explode, the first thing, so he said, was Scheissen. And he goes, well, I suppose I'm going home. And probably within five minutes of that, one of our controls had strung up a big four sail all over the Mercedes racks. I was sort of hoping they were going to leave them, but so they never did. But yeah, it's, look, one thing so you realize in this industry is nothing is 100%. Uh, you know, so whether we've had spacecraft that, and sometimes there can be silly errors. I can remember the, the Phobos missions uh, that we supported. Uh, so, you know, so, and it was all down to a controller switching off the batteries and a solar panel at the same time. So, or heaters being switched off and so sort of spacecraft essentially freezing. I mean, there's, there's so many variables that you have in space. So, and there's so many errors that you can make and some of them just aren't recoverable. You can't just, walk up there and press the reset button. Uh, but also you've got the same issues here on Earth, you know? So the antennas, although I said they're big and robust, you know, the, the specifications required to, to track a spacecraft are absolutely minute. They're mind boggling, you know? So when you, you start looking at the, the, the beam width, so I keep on looking at the 70 meter at my window. You look at the beam width of the, the 70 meter, I'll give you a picture just because I can. <laughs> there it is. So if you look at that, the beam width of the 70 meter uh, is, you know, so with uh, X band, it's uh, 32 milli degrees. You know, so with S band, it's 118. And that's for the three, so you half that, and which means that that's your error. And then you, you drop, you're dropping the spacecraft by 3 dB, uh, which is enough to kill telemetry if you don't have those margins. Uh, so there's always things that the sub reflector on 43 we had issues with uh, a little while ago. So, if, and it just took one tiny component, and so if it was wiping out one spacecraft out after another. Uh, you're talking about the, you know, the earthquakes in Madrid uh, as well. So, look, there's, there's so many good star stories. And uh, I saw one of my favorites is Cassini. Uh, you know, so as, as we were talking about before, you know, I was there at the end as well. And it was actually a really sad day. Uh, it was a sad day because I think I'd actually stamped this human type personality onto it because spacecraft do have personalities. So whatever people try and tell you otherwise. Uh, and it's a bit like a person. So when you talk to them, you know, so you pick up their mannerisms, their characteristics, and, and you form an impression. It's the same with spacecraft. Uh, some of them are unreliable. Uh, some of them are always late, just like people. Uh, some of them can go for a bit of a wobble. They can you know, go a little unstable occasionally, and we have to adapt for that. Uh, you know, so I think you had a gentleman talking about the Marcos uh, from JPL. And look, the Marcos were a brilliant mission. Uh, so it was, as far as cost, cost effective and, and essentially success. So, I mean, they, they brought the insight data down flawlessly. Uh, but when he was talking about the, the loss of propellant, so we were seeing that on the ground. You know, we're the ones that are saying to project, look, you know, we're, we're seeing oscillations here. So uh, we're seeing fluctuations. It looks as if your spacecraft is rolling. And so, so it's a DSN, they'll see telemetry, but without any telemetry, they can't interpret. 
Uh, so what we have to, to do is say, well, this is what we see on the ground. You know, we are seeing oscillations. We are seeing variations every minute and a half as your spacecraft is rolling. Uh, and that's, you know, you were talking about spacecraft, distant ones as well, and, and the voyages. And both voyages at the moment, although they're in interstellar space, uh, so and drifting on, they're really dynamic spacecraft. Uh, so two or three times so an hour, they actually have to correct the pointing on the eigen antenna. It's got a 12 foot uh, antenna that has to be orientated to, to Earth. Uh, it has a sun sensor, which uh, so obviously uses our sun to sense, just, uh, which corrects the yaw and pitch. Uh, but then you've also got uh, so sort of the, the star scanner as well that controls roll. And I always thought that once the Voyager was going to disappear, it was going to be through power. A little RTG, yes, it's half-life and the, the thermocouples are degrading as well. But for the first time, we were having issues with that, uh, pointing from Voyager 1. And we were seeing those on the, on the downlink as well. They were slowly dipping and we were having problems locking. So from 22 billion kilometers, Project was able to send corrections to the, the sun sensor and biases. But it, it made me realize that it's not just power. There are so many things that can happen to, to all spacecraft that can be showstoppers. And you're talking about the, the purpose of the DSN. Yes, we have an antenna on Earth. But a spacecraft has an antenna as well that it has to orientate to Earth. And if the two aren't pointing at each other, then there's no mission. Uh, so some spacecraft will have low-gain antennas, which they can use to, if there's an error, to flip to, allow us to get commands in and, and hopefully uh, correct an issue. But with the Voyagers, they're so far out, so they have a high-gain antenna and a high-gain antenna. So if it's not pointing to Earth, then I said the, uh, the mission ends. So there's, there's always things going wrong. Uh, and that's why we're here. You know, those spacecraft that need very little interaction. Uh, we can configure it. Uh, and sort of support it, finish up, and then we have the ones that are very much uh, manual stick control. Uh, and, and they're actually the fun ones. Now you're talking about uh, lunar orbiters. We've got uh, Mandrayan, sorry, Chandrayaan at the moment, the, the ISRO sp uh, spacecraft. And uh, it's very much manual as it comes out of occultation around the moon. So we manually sort of enable drive to actually capture the spacecraft. Uh, so send a command to it. We see the spacecraft go two-way because it's so coherency is what we're looking for, where essentially the spacecraft references our clock. Uh, really good for Doppler. We can tell exactly the velocity of the spacecraft. And so, yeah, and then we, we get telemetry from it. So every day is interesting. And it's not just all about experiences of, because every spacecraft is different. As I said, there's personality. Do you have your favorites and not so favorites? Uh, <laughs> and that comes down to the characteristics of the spacecraft. And do you have a favorite spacecraft? Or is that sort of like asking what's your favorite child? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'll be quite happy to throw a, a number of them under the bus, but uh, I won't <laughs> tell you which ones. That is, uh, <laughs> uh, as I say, it all comes, uh, look, I, I have uh, probably, sentimental uh, sort of attachment to both voyages. And as I said, that's because they've lasted my entire career. Um, and if they can just last another five or six years and see, we'll retire together. So, and then <laughs> I'd, I'd hate to think I was a two spacecraft uh, controller. So lasted uh, the entire period. Uh, projects I really like at the moment, uh, the MMS, uh, the, the magnospheric multi-scale spacecraft, and that's just because of the scope. You know? So they're looking for the magnetic connect uh, between uh, the sun and Earth. And they're flying in flotilla with a degree of accuracy just is just mind-boggling. And they'll zoom in around Earth and close up, and they'll go into a data collection mode as, as it comes back out, dumps data. And it was actually an interesting one, because when MMS came along, it was actually a bit of a pain spacecraft to support. Uh, so there's four of them, and they have to be tracked in sequence. So one, two, three, four. And you're talking about scheduling, so sort of being tight, to actually incorporate the MMS supports. 
our countdown time had to be reduced between them. So down, and instead of normally 45 minutes, 10 minutes. So we went from one spacecraft to another uh, with only a 10 minute gap. Uh, but they, as far as the mission, brilliant. It, it, it did offer a, a couple of challenges tracking, but uh, you know, so that's become the norm now. Uh, but even at, uh, Parker, uh, the solar probe, that's, a, that's another amazing one. And you know, so if it's a, a support that has so many stages. You know, you get where it's, it's about to enter, essentially not far from the sun's atmosphere, where we have problems talking to it on a really low rate. To as it comes out again, so sort of free of the sun's influence, and it can downlink, you know, you know the high rate K band data. And, and it's flying out as far as almost Venus. In fact, they're, they're actually about to go through a, a Venus flyby. Uh, so look, there's so many really interesting ones. You have ones that you, you like a little less, but that's purely because they're difficult to support. Uh, I would have thought Cassini, Cassini was, 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 as I said, a lovely one, but it was a pain. You know? So <laughs> this was a spacecraft not only whizzing around Saturn, but it was doing the moons one moon after the other. And, they had these experiments called uh, bi-static radar, where essentially they use the transmitters on, on Cassini to bounce off Titan, and we'll receive those bounce signals uh, at Earth. And the preamble for the support was like three hours where we were, we were just following one sequence after another, and there was hundreds of steps to, to calibrate our downlink systems. Uh, so yeah, that was a pain, but the, I, I still have fond memories of Cassini as well. And with the Voyager spacecraft, I mean, they're 42 years old. Uh, Voyager 1 is 22 billion kilometers away from us. How do you, how do you like, work with something that's that far away? I mean, the transmitter on Voyager, I think it's like 20 watts, I think, is how much power it puts yeah. out. It's ridiculously tiny. And then also, like, you, do you have to use support equipment from 42 years ago to talk to it? Uh, yes, in, in a way. So even the, they've had to... We now have an industry standard. So actually, I should point out that any any mission now that uses um, essentially a CCSDS format, which is an industry standard for uh, communicating to to the spacecraft, uh, so that so it means that what we can track any agency spacecraft as long as they're using that international standard. Uh, Voyager's had to adapt to that a little bit. So uh, with the commanding, for instance, they've had to form or go in or transfer into those types of blocks. But no, look, as people keep on thinking because we have a spacecraft 22 billion kilometers away, it's, it must be the weakest spacecraft we support. Uh, and it, it's not, so by, not by a long shot. So if you start, and it all comes down to the mission purpose. Obviously Voyager, huge high gain antenna to deliver to, uh, data down to Earth. A 20, 20 watt transmitter or 22 watt transmitter. So, and and we st we're still able to get 160 bits down uh, with plenty of margin on the 70 meters. Uh, so, Voyager 1 still has a working eight track tape recorder uh, <laughs> as well. And so, uh, every few months it will do a, a dump of that data. So, and essentially, normally it's always covered on, on Goldstone and uh, it's say 1400 bits down, and they need the 70 meter and all three beam wave guides uh, arraying for that one as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, that in itself is kind of incredible that we can get 1.4K from, from 22 billion kilometers away. But I so say it depends on the purpose of the spacecraft. Now we've got MAVEN for instance around Mars and a, a previous spacecraft messenger where the primary goal of, of the project is to collect the science data. So while it's orientating its high gain antenna to the planet, it, it's using a low gain antenna from the back. So, uh, and the, the signal that it's being received is far lower than the Voyager signal that we receive normally. Uh, and the bit rate is lower as well. You know, we, we can be receiving 11 bits per second. And all they require is a spacecraft help. So within that 11 bits, it's just saying either yes, I'm happy or, or no, I need a little bit of attention. Just like uh, New Horizons did so on its nine year journey out to Pluto. So it will go into hibernation. 
uh, for the long periods to conserve power. Uh, and every now and again, it would send a simple tone down, a one, of, one of four tones. Uh, you had a, obviously a happy, happy tone, a sad tone, and indeterminate tones in between. Uh, so, and, and that was really low as well, because it was using its low gain antenna. So it's, yeah, it's a strange one. You think the further out it is, obviously needs a bigger antenna, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, so it really depends on, on the mission and, uh, and, and, and their design. And even though Cassini was a little bit of a, I guess, a pain, um, if you will, for the Deep Space <laughs> Network, uh, Mini Stone. In the best possible way, I should point out to the Cassini folks. Oh yeah, definitely. It's always it's a great problem to have. Uh, Mini Stone is just asking, um, you know, uh, what was it like to see the loss of the Cassini signal in real time? Because that was a it was a nearly twenty year mission wrapping up. Yeah, you it got was. to watch that happen. I, I suppose bittersweet would be the best way best way to describe it. So you had the Obviously, so uh, you had the sense of loss, and it was literally a sense of loss. Actually, you only saw the two. We, we were lucky, so we'd actually uh, set it up so you saw three frequencies. And uh, I was doing uh, an interview with Catalyst at the time, and I was predicting how the signals were going to disappear. I was saying, well, based on the beam width of the antenna, the first one to disappear would, would be K-band. And so uh, the next one, because it's such a, a tight beam, and then the next one that would disappear was X-band because that's you know, it's a little broader. And then the last one is a more is a big robust Sierra band. And so as I was seeing one after the other disappear, each one was a sense of loss. Uh, but then after they all disappeared, it was a case, case of what a brilliantly successful mission that was. So suddenly it was wow, what an accomplishment the, you know, so, uh, these guys have. Have made and so so yeah as I said bittersweet it brought down some amazing science uh, it was at, oh there we go so we got X band and S there was also a K band as well which was uh, coming down on a on a, a 34 meter uh, 43 strangely enough doesn't have a DSN K band uh, frequency band so uh, yeah so 43 is the oh there we go. And it's funny the thing to think of afterwards because after I'd done the interview, I'm thinking, oh, did I get the order right? I had so many self doubts of getting the order right of which ones. And I had, it was only when I forced myself to watch it again that, that I did get it right. But yeah, I was a little paranoid there for a while that it had been broadcast in error. Uh, but yeah, so, so Cassini was, was, it was, look, that was a fun mission. Uh, actually, I, I should point out. When you asked about favorite missions, probably Hayabusa. Uh, you know, so if you're ever going to launch a Swiss Army Knives of spacecraft, ask the Japanese. So, I mean, that's just, we have our own uh, sort of asteroid chaser with the Cyrix uh, going to, to Bennu, uh, but the, the Hayabusa around Ragu, and it's just on its way back now. And uh, its little sample of the asteroid is going to be dropped in South Australia. Uh, so, and but that was, we, 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 we always get the briefings. So before any activity comes, they call that, we put everything into levels. Level one is the most critical and it's normally a launch uh, or, a, or a landing or, or a, an orbit insertion. And then you have level two, which is pretty darn close to a one. Level three sort of is, is heightened awareness. And when we get a level three, they have to provide a briefing of, of what the spacecraft is doing. And Hayabusa, it was just like, you, you look at the briefing going, seriously, they're doing this? Whether it's throwing ballistic projectiles at the asteroid, throwing little rovers at it, so throwing out markers as it's uh, orbiting this thing. Uh, as far as brilliance, the, the Hayabusa mission, I think, so would, would be right up there. Well, yeah, I, I remember seeing a lot of those images and things from it too, and they just, Swiss Army knife really is a good way to describe uh, just how much they packed. Into have a that blade location. for everything. Yeah, exactly. Even a bottle opener uh, to cr crack open some samples <laughs> from the surface as well. Um, so when there is uh, like a major problem with a spacecraft, how does the Deep Space Network handle that? Well, so for, first of all, we have to categorize it. Um, you know, we're, I was talking about the issue with, with, with Voyager and the project 
they're, they're looking at data coming down. And if we can't deliver data, we have to give them a, give them a reason why. And uh, you know, so we'll say, look, we're seeing that the spacecraft is, uh, is low, for instance. Uh, the signal we're seeing from the spacecraft is low. Uh, we'll go through troubleshooting on the ground <clears throat> to make sure that there's nothing wrong with the antenna pointing, the low noise amplifiers, uh, the receiver systems. We have redundancy for a number of things, not all. Um, if we can, we can throw another asset onto it, another antenna, just to verify that there is an issue. Uh, so project don't see telemetry, and, and we're trying our hardest to deliver it. So whether it means moving up a size of antenna, going for 70 meter, uh, is, is one thing. Uh, we're also looking at the profile from the, de uh, from the spacecraft as well. You know, are, are we seeing it modulated? Has the spacecraft gone into safing? You know, so every spacecraft has a safing mode or an emergency mode where if something goes wrong, for instance, there's a clash between the CPUs or whether the star scanners got out of alignment, it goes into a, a safing mode. The safing mode normally means that you know, it'll it will kind of reset, it will go to a low gain antenna, uh, it will go to a low bit rate as well. So if we see that break from a high rate to suddenly we go low rate, then we start saying we need to reconfigure for that uh, possible spacecraft saving, and we'll inform project as well. So yeah, I think for the DSN, a lot of the, the time it's a case of, okay, what are we seeing that the project can't? Uh, what can we interpret and, and tell project that, uh, you know, it's the possible issues? You know, we, we knew from the Voyager, the Voyager project thought that they were, they were hitting link march and they thought the Voyager 1 was getting too far out. And uh, what we were seeing didn't, didn't make sense then because it wasn't just a spacecraft decaying. We were seeing a spacecraft that was oscillating. Uh, so sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad. And we were able to feed that back to the project as well and said, well, we don't believe it's link margin. What we think is there's some sort of orientation of the high gain antenna, uh, because we're actually seeing it. it wasn't just a sinusoidal wave, it was an abrupt change. So we'd see the cycle with a slight kick at the bottom, and that was obviously uh, the little thrusters on board. So with the, the sun sensor just moving off just a little bit, detecting that it, it was off point and then just kicking in again. And that's when we saw the signal improve and it would drift off. So a lot of it is uh, is characterizing what we're seeing and, uh, and informing the project. And what's the future of the deep space network looking like? Because we have a lot of Rosie. Uh, yeah, there's a <laughs> lot of folks uh, in our chat room that are asking that. You know, um, Head Crab on YouTube yeah. is asking. You know, with more and more missions and rovers, is there a limit to what you can do? Stephen Porter, Look, it's, it's it's incredible. Actually, so there was an earlier question about uh, human space flight as well. Uh -huh. and strangely enough, we haven't. We haven't heard a huge amount of how the DSM will support it, although we have been told it will be supported, uh, not only the, Mar uh, the lunar missions, but also the Mars missions. Uh, we, we are going through software upgrades as well, and uh, our new data delivery system has now been modified to, uh, to include essentially voice communications. Uh, it's a self-proclaimed, we'll, we'll declare ourselves astronaut ready, uh, because we can, we can now do, do all aspects of, the, uh, of support. So as I said, we can deliver telemetry and voice. We're still not sure what the demands of the DSN are going to be when Artemis so sort of goes up. We've, we're hearing conflicting sort of reports of, you know, they may not want support every day to, yes, it's, it's going to be fairly intensive. And uh, until that solidifies, I, I think it's very hard to plan for. But you know, when I first started, uh, we we were actually supporting uh, so shuttle before the Tedros network went up. So, so in my career, I have a, a little bit of experience uh, with supporting human spaceflight, uh, and I can remember in those days it was it was incredibly arduous because there was a, a level of competence competency required that we've never had to deal with before. And I said, so if, if that comes. Uh, comes in for uh, the new human space flight. It's going to make things really interesting for the DSN. And also, uh, John Benstead in YouTube is asking, will the deep space network support commercial spacecraft that venture beyond cislunar space? So is there any, any potential like private partnerships that are going to happen? 
Well, I suppose SpaceX would probably be the, uh, although SpaceX is, is trying to, to find their own network as well. <clears throat> you know, I suppose we have to remember the DSN is not the only game in town. Mm -hmm. uh, the DSN is by far the largest. Uh, so we also have the, heat, the ESA network as well. Uh, we have a number of commercial players coming in into the scene too, who, who are looking at supporting the, the, the SpaceX's uh, so and, and the more commercial aspects uh, of, of, of space communications. Uh, as far as NASA, look, if, if somebody, if a commercial entity, so went to NASA and said, this is what we're proposing, I'm sure that it would certainly be considered. Uh, you know, I said, we are doing Israel. We did do the Israelis at really short notice as well. Uh, and that was a semi-commercial. Uh, that was, a, I think, a, a privately funded spacecraft. So, so yeah, it's certainly on the on the books, but ultimately, the DSN has to support NASA spacecraft. And so, as soon as we're taking on commercial customers, that that gives less time to to our core business, which is NASA spacecraft. All right. So basically, if you want to support your spacecraft, uh, kind of build your own, or or uh, you know, give NASA a little little reason uh, for doing that with you there. Oh, that's, 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 that's right. You know, <laughs> I say there are different ones. I mean, there's a, there's a number of networks for close, close Earth. You know, you've got the USNO and the Swedish Space Corporation as well. Uh, I think the Chinese are building a, 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 their own uh, sub-network too. Uh, the Indians have a deep space network, but it's really just limited to, to the skies over India. Uh, so and that's the same with JAXA, uh, and that's that's probably why we we, we we support a lot of the other agencies as well. Not everybody wants to have to to build antennas all over the world. You know, they'll they'll build one in their their home country, and uh, they'll they'll ask another agency to, to support their spacecraft during critical supports, uh, knowing that for the majority of it, they'll be able to support through their own antennas. And to kind of wrap it up here from our YouTube chat, we have a question from R1, which is uh, uh, something that everybody always, you know, everybody always asks them this, uh, which is that if you had all the funding you wanted, so since you guys are, the Deep Space Network is supported by NASA, if you had all the funding you wanted, what would you do with the current system? Boy, more antennas. <laughs> so we, we had a, a group of senators out here, and he said so, no. and it was a similar question. You know, so what, what could we, with you, and I said, more assets. You know, so when you start having projects uh, fighting over time, you know, so uh, arguing over who has priority, so then maybe you don't have enough assets. And so I, I think that'd be the biggest thing. I'd, ha I'd have the, the, the 34 meters are, are great antennas, a little jelly mold antennas, a couple of years construction. Uh, we can array, uh, I didn't really cover that, but we can array our antennas. Uh, so that you know, it takes four 34 meters, sort of for the equivalent 70 on the downlinks. Uh, but but yeah, so the, the more antennas, the better, I, I think. So we have the infrastructure in place. We have the control room. Uh, all we need is uh, the, the physical hardware in the field. Yeah. Well, it's so cool to hear about the Deep Space Network, the literal bandwidth of the solar system uh, talking <laughs> all around and getting that to everybody. And maybe uh, one day we can do uh, tomorrow from Mars and we'll have to use the uh, Deep Space Network. Actually, actually, just on a parting note, so I was listening <laughs> to uh, an interview with somebody who had put their name down for the Mars, uh, humans to Mars, and they were, they were talking about sort of their journey to Mars. And they were saying, but that's okay. Communications is, is, is fine. You know? We can communicate and, um, and we have Skype. And I can remember my first thought was, it would be a little stilted in conversation. So I think so Mars at its closest is sort of well, six, seven minutes round trip light time. Furthest is 44 minutes. So if you're expecting this chat to Mars, <laughs> Uh, so with a 44 minutes uh, sort of cause and effect, so to get a response, I think so, yeah, it'd be a very long conversation.
All right, well, I guess we're gonna have to bring someone along to chat with us uh, in order to do that. And you know, we have a ton of questions that we didn't even get to uh, with you, Richard. So we're gonna go ahead and do those uh, in, in our after show today um, to talk with that. Yeah. And uh, one of the ways that you can see that is if you become a citizen of tomorrow. And we always wanna thank our citizens of tomorrow as well because we can't do this show without you. We can't do the news without you. We can't do letting off steam without you. You're the ones who help make this happen. And if you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, you can head on over to youtube.com slash TMRO slash join. And you get to see things like what we're about to do after the show with Richard, which is basically everybody who's asked a question so far, we'll try and grab all those questions and throw them at Richard and get you that opportunity to talk to somebody who's actually doing real stuff stuff, which is so cool. I'm so glad we get to do that. And our ultimate goal is to get people excited about space and our citizens help us do that. And you get to do some cool stuff on the side with that. So that wraps up Orbit 12.36 for us here today. So until the next one, keep exploring.